Um, you know, you're at the center of a lot of trends, uh, some very positive, others sort of we talk about every day, whether it's supply chain or raw material cost increases. And I want to get to that to begin here. You, you know, supplier price increases and ship shortages and logistics costs, full input year cost pressure went from 250 million to, I think, about 375 million. How are you dealing with that? Really two ways, David, and thank you for having me. Partly on price, we've been very, very aggressive in price. And in the fourth quarter, we'll be price cost neutral. And the second piece is managing all the controllables. So what we're doing is very tactically getting through the supply chain issues now, but longer term, we're investing in automation. A couple of years ago, we had a million automation hours. This year, we'll have three million automation hours and we're on our way to six million. We're investing in dual sourcing. Last year, we had 25% of our critical components were dual sourced. This year, it's going to be 35% on our way to 75%. So what we have to do is two things. Raise prices aggressively as we can, and we are doing that. We've announced further price increases earlier this week. And then set up a more resilient supply chain for the future. Right. And when it comes to pricing actions, and I want to talk to you more, I know, about the supply chain as well. Uh, in terms of additional pricing actions you may take to offset those rising inflationary pressures, what will they be? Earlier this week, we announced up to a 10% price increase for our residential business, up to 12% for our light commercial business. And then business by business around the world, we're having to take very aggressive actions, but in a very constructive way with our customers, because they understand it. They're seeing pressures across the supply chain from everyone. So we're really leaning into price. And you know, the good news is on the supply chain side is that we're keeping up generally with this demand. You know, David, we came into this year thinking that our sales would be up 5% year over year. We just raised our sales forecast, you know, today for the third time. It's now going to be up 13% year over year. So it does put a lot of pressure on the supply chain, but generally we're supporting it, albeit at higher input costs. Yeah, well, I know you, you know, you talked a bit about having a supply chain war room that operates 24 hours a day. Um, I assume you didn't have one a year ago. What exactly is going on in that room? What are people doing during those 24 hours? Actually, funny enough, we set it up. When COVID hit, we set up a supply chain war room because we were dealing with all of our suppliers dealing with COVID issues. It's just now morphed into this supply, you know, supply demand imbalance. So that war room has now progressed. And we have, because we're such a global business, 80% of our people are outside the United States. So we have a very formal transition from North America, Europe, Asia, where we have uh, a commodity management war room that takes over any acute supplier issues and it goes from a series of handoffs. So we are having to be very tactical now. I think eventually as you get into the latter part of next year, you will have supply and demand more in balance and then prices, input costs will start to modulate a bit. I think the good news for us is we're going into next year with eyes wide open on the inflationary input side. So we came into this year thinking we'd have 30 million of inflationary pressure. As you just said, it's now 375 million. So we've been kind of chasing it this year on the price side. We're now announcing our price increases now, expecting kind of the inflationary pressures to continue. So we're well set up to be price cost positive for next year. Dave, it's Morgan. Let's talk hydrofluorocarbons for a moment, because even as you're talking about all of this increased demand and what it means for the company, you did have the Biden administration not so long ago say that it's going to reduce the use of uh, HFCs, which are used in air conditioning and refrigeration by 85 percent over the next 15 years. How does that take place at Carrier? What does it mean for your company? Yeah, we've been seeing this coming both in North America and Europe after the Kigali Amendment. So we've expected the reduction in HFCs clearly that we'll make sure that we continue to buy at the existing HFCs to be protected. But what will happen in the United States in 2025 is that the existing HFCs will be replaced by a much, a much very different refrigerant that has a much lower GWP, a global warming potential. So we're making sure that we innovate and protect ourselves on the supply chain side.